Welcome to this video. We're going to learn about torque. Let's say you're trying to loosen a bolt, and so you put a wrench on the bolt, and you put your hand on the wrench, and you pull with the force. If it doesn't turn, what's your next resort? You're probably going to try and pull with a harder force, because bigger forces are better at turning. Now, let's say it still doesn't turn. What's the next thing you try? Well, you're probably going to slide your hand farther out toward the end and you're going to pull with that force. So we can already see that the, the location impacts how much turning you do. I mean, if you tried to push right at the bolt itself, you would absolutely get no turning at this location right here. So there are two things we could point to which the ability to turn depends on. The first thing is the magnitude of the force. How big is the force? And the second thing is the distance of the force from the pivot point. You get more turning when you're really far from the pivot point, and less turning really close, and no turning when you're on the pivot point. But there's a third thing we could point to. If you came along and you put a force all the way at the end, a force like this, and you pushed in, would this force do any turning, even though it's big, even though it's at the edge? No, that force wouldn't do any turning. Why? Because of its angle. So the angle or direction also impacts the ability to turn. This is the equation for torque. Torque, which is capital gamma, is the ability to turn, the ability of a force to turn, and we see that it incorporates all of these three things. It incorporates the magnitude of the force, F, it incorporates the distance of the force from the pivot, r, that's what r is, the distance from the pivot, and it includes the angle or direction, theta. So let's take a picture, uh, let's take a look again at these two forces with this equation. The first force was down, the second force was also down. Now they had different distances, r. Here's the first distance from the pivot, and here's the distance from the pivot for the second force. And what's theta exactly? Theta is the angle between the distance and the force. So it's the angle again between blue and red. Now it's possible for there to be more than one torque produced at one time. You know, if one person is pulling down but another person is pulling up, now you have two different torques. Before we can add these torques, we need to know how directions work. There are two different ways that an object can rotate about a pivot point. It can go counterclockwise or anti-clockwise as it's called in IB, or it could go clockwise. Now the sign convention we use is anti-clockwise is positive and, uh, and clockwise is negative. So what about these two forces? Which, ones, uh, which one is positive, which is negative? Well, this force here is trying to turn the thing like that, because here's the pivot, so it circles the pivot. The arrow doesn't represent where the bar would be located. The arrow represents which way the force is pointing, which way you're pulling. So this person is pulling in a different direction. They're trying to rotate that way. So this force would be neg this torque would be negative, and this torque would be positive because this one is anti-clockwise and this is clockwise. We add torques together to get the net, and every every individual torque is made positive or negative based on its direction. We could write the net, net torque equation like this, or we could write it by breaking each torque into F R sine theta, force times distance from pivot and sine of the angle. Now if the net torque is zero, if the net torque is zero, then that means the object is either not rotating at all or it's rotating at a constant angular speed. So when the net torque is zero, either you're not rotating at all or you're rotating at constant angular speed and the clockwise torques balance the anti-clockwise torques. Now, I'm just curious, is that possible in the picture I've drawn? Do those torques, could they possibly balance? 
you might be thinking, well, this force is much farther out. So this torque, right, this, uh, anti, this anti-clockwise torque has to be bigger than this one because R is bigger over here. So there, you might be thinking that. You might be thinking there's no way they can balance. But in fact, that's not the whole story. Even though this one has a bigger R, even though R2 is bigger, F2 is smaller, the arrow is shorter, and the force is weaker. So it is possible that these two torques could balance. This person has a smaller force, I'm sorry, a yeah, smaller force, but a bigger distance from the pivot. Let's take a look at a concrete example. You've got a seesaw. This right here is called the fulcrum. It's the triangular support. And then you have two known masses, one unknown mass. And in the problem, we're also given some distances. From the fulcrum, the pivot, to uh, this mass is 2 meters. The distance to this mass is 3. And the distance to this one is 2.5. Now this is clearly not drawn to scale. We have to find the unknown mass, find m. We're also told that the object is in, uh, the seesaw is in rotational equilibrium, and it's in translational equilibrium. So this block is pulling down on the seesaw with its weight, with its force of gravity. This one is pulling on the seesaw with its force of gravity, and likewise for the 20 kilogram. The force of gravity, remember, is mass times 9.81. So this first seesaw, is trying to produce, I'm sorry, this first block is trying to produce an anti-clockwise torque. This one is trying to produce an anti-clockwise torque because here's the pivot right here. So if this is the pivot, you can either go around anti-clockwise or you can go clockwise. What about this one? This last mass is trying to produce a clockwise torque around this pivot. So if the thing is in equilibrium, then we know the torque from this first mass plus the torque from the 15 kilograms plus the negative torque from the 20 kilograms because it's clockwise. So you add a negative because it's clockwise. Putting the three together must be zero because it is in rotational equilibrium. It's not moving at all. So we could take this equation and rewrite it as fr sine theta, fr sine theta. Now the last fr sine theta for 20 kilograms, I've moved over to the right side. So I've added this to the right side, so now it's positive again. In each case, the angle between the red line, the force, and the blue line, the distance, the angle is 90. And the sine of 90 is 1. That's true here and here and here. So we could take away the times 1. The next thing we could do is plug in values. Each force is m times g. Here's a force, which is m times g. Here's a force, which is m times g. And then you plug in the distances, and you solve for m. Now, the final thing we could do is we could balance up and down. There's one more force that I didn't draw the fulcrum is pushing up on the seesaw, on the beam. So that fulcrum has to be pushing up, supporting that beam's weight. Now, let's say we have just these three forces. Let's say for a second that the beam itself doesn't have any weight. Okay, so we're just trying to balance forces from the masses, M, 15, and 20. We're ignoring any weight the fulcrum it, that the beam itself might have. In addition to balancing torques, we could also balance up and down forces. The forces that point down, there's this 6.67 uh, this kilogram mass pulls down with its weight, the 15 kilograms pulls down with its weight, and the 20 pulls down with its weight. So if we add those three forces together, we have to get the total up force, which is just the force of the fulcrum. Nothing else pushes up on the beam. So from that process, you can calculate the force of the fulcrum. This should say F fulcrum, which is roughly 373.